Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Gaida. I'm Executive Vice President of Geopolitical Strategy and Risk at Weber Shandwick. And today I am really honored to be joined by General Joseph Votel, who is President and CEO of Business Executives for National Security as of January this year. Uh, and this is following a 39 year military career in which he served as Commander of US Central Command, US Special Operations Command, and the Joint Special Operations Command. And so we're really lucky to have the General with us today. Welcome, sir. Thanks for being with me. It's great to be with you, Michelle. Thanks. So I'm really eager to talk to you about leadership, about readiness, especially in terms of um, crises and, and being ready in crises like these. So where does data come into that process? So for us and our clients, we're, we're very focused on informing our thinking and our actions with as much data and insights as possible. So we understand the information environment, the attitudes and perceptions of the, the people we're trying to engage. Um, when there is so much swirl as there is now, can you tell us a little bit about how you translate data into real-time intelligence for a battlefield? situation. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, a, this is a real challenge, particularly today when we have so many sources of information and so many things are out there in open sources and through classified systems and stuff like that. I, I think the technique that uh, we've refined in the military, and I know I certainly relied on, is this idea of information fusion. And the idea is to bring the, bring you the, the, terminus of your information into one location so that uh, you can look at it all together. Now, we do that through something we call fusion cells, uh, where we may have representatives from a lot of different organizations or agencies that are supporting us in one location with uh, with a leader there. And you're looking at all that information at the same time. So you're understanding how one thing is impacting another, and you're actually building a much more uh, comprehensive picture. And we've seen this in, in practice. It's something really unique to the military. If you look at the FBI, for example, their, the use of their uh, counterterrorism task forces they have around major urban areas in our country, the idea is to pull all kinds of disparate law enforcement and other agencies into one location so all the information is coming in there and it's available to the decision makers. I think this is, and we see the same thing with disaster relief when you have a bad situation, whether it's a hurricane or a flood or whatever it is, where you're able to pull all that information into one location. Uh, this to me is a really, really effective way of making sure you're getting the benefit of, of all the information that's out there and you're getting it in the more of a synthesized fashion. So let's talk a little bit about communications when it comes to leadership. Um, our research that we've done shows that employees who are um, hearing from their companies uh, regularly are a lot more positive than others, right? There's a 50 point attitudinal difference, in fact, between employees who are hearing from their companies versus those who aren't. What is your perspective on the role of communications in leadership? And what advice would you have for CEOs and their corporate communications officers right now? Well, I would absolutely agree with the statistics you cited there. I think that's extraordinary. Right? Communications is absolutely essential. I was talking to a CEO the other day, uh, and he was talking about, uh, you know, as, as they're preparing for their plan to come back to work, what they have found is the communications to their to their employees, the direct communications from leadership to employees has been absolutely essential in addressing fear and confusion and concern about what's happening next. So you cannot underestimate, I think, the importance of of uh, of communication. Frankly, you know, as in my experience here, I, <clears throat> I think that you know being able to effectively communicate is really, I think, one of the one of the principal uh, leadership skills for leaders at senior levels. Certainly, whether whether it's in the military or business or government or whatever whatever particular sector you find yourselves in, it's absolutely essential. We see a big opportunity for business to step up and to lead. How can or should businesses deliver on this leader leadership opportunity, or in some cases maybe even a leadership mandate? Well, I, you know, I think the, the first way is for leadership to, you know, to exert leadership over your own over your own organizations, just as we talk about communicating effectively with your employees, with your communities, uh, sharing empathy with the situation that uh, that people find themselves in is is obviously very important. This is this is. This is basic. Uh, this is basic leadership here, and the, and the basics really matter, especially in periods like we're dealing with now, where it's great uncertainty. So you know, setting an example, being uh, empathetic, um, communicating what's happening, being very clear, uh, being deliberate in terms of your actions are all really important things that business leaders can do. But as we address the overall situation here. 
I think it's also important to recognize that there is a relationship between business leadership, the private sector, the public sector, and the civic sector. Uh, you know, nonprofit organizations, civic groups, individual citizens out there. And, and as we address these types of uh, far-reaching problems like we're dealing with in the pandemic here, uh, we have to look for solutions that include all three of those sectors working in conjunction with each other at multiple levels. You know, in the government side, it's federal, state, local. Um, and it's not all that different when you look at some of the other uh, other aspects of this, private and, and civic. So business plays a very important role in, 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 uh, in addressing the pandemic here. How important are purpose and values to leading from your personal experience? Well, I think they're absolutely critical. I mean, the values and culture, uh, I think, are really kind of the guideposts that uh, the leaders use uh, when they get into uncertain waters here, if you will. And they are the things that kind of help give you some anchor in terms of the things that you're that you're doing. I would venture to say many of our businesses out there have their own, you know, identified organizational cultures. What you know, what they believe in, what their purpose is, and those two are important things to always think about when you get into uncertain situations because when you begin to veer from from your culture you begin to veer from your uh, from your values then you are really in uncharted waters and you don't have anything to ground ground you and bring you back to what's important for you what's important for your organization let's talk a little bit about a culture of readiness so one of the things that i was very aware of during my time as assistant secretary of state dealing with matters all across the globe was that there was always something else that was over the horizon and it required a constant state of readiness and awareness um, and almost a healthy state of paranoia to make sure that you were thinking about not only what was in front of you but but what else might be around there um, can you talk a little bit about how you dedicate the right focus and the right attention to the crisis that's at hand while still maintaining the right awareness and knowledge of um, or how to anticipate what might be around the corner how can business leaders build that into their culture and to their operations I think one of the important things for leaders in whatever sector to do is to articulate priorities. What what what's important now, and how does that how does that sit in relation to the other things we're doing? Uh, you know, very rare military leaders like business leaders can rarely just focus on one thing for a long period of time. They've got a lot of things going on, and they've got to be able to they've got to be able to address that. But within that, I think if you can talk about what what uh, what your priorities are, uh, how you look at things, I think that helps the organization begin to think about it and gets them focused on that. So I think the first thing is setting priorities. The other thing is, is that, uh, you know, um, uh, I think one of the challenges we always have in the military, particularly with young leaders, is getting them to delegate responsibility, to recognize, yes, you have a role in kind of what happens with your organization, but you can't influence everything. You've got to rely and trust the people below you to actually carry out the instructions that you're providing to them. So uh, you have to you have to be able to give clear guidance. You have to be able to trust people. Um, uh, Secretary Mattis used to always emphasize uh, to us is that the you know the the key is is getting uh, decision-making made at the lowest competent level, uh, trusting your people to do that, inculcating a culture of trust that we're, we we got you, we've given you guidance, we've trained you, you're, you, you're capable of doing this. We're going to trust the decisions you make. If it goes a little bit awry here, we're going to we're going to back you up in terms of that, providing some trust. But in these kinds of situations, I think that uh, uh, when a lot going on, our, we, our leadership does have to trust business or government has to trust the people that are down there closest to the problem and trust that they're going to do the right thing. And then make sure they give, they're given the tools, the guidance, the resources, the support to, uh, to actually, actually make the right decisions. You talked earlier about empathy. Uh, so as a leader, where does compassion, where does empathy come into play? Um, and do you have any examples from um, times that you've had to put those uh, into practice in, in terms of your own leadership? Yeah, I think it's important for people to understand the difference between empathy and sympathy. Um, and I think it's an important aspect for, for leaders. You know, empathy is about understanding and sharing, um, you know, fe feelings with others, uh, you know, uh, things that they're doing and, 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 and sharing, uh, sharing in that, uh, in that, uh, in those feelings. And sympathy is, is more about 
pity and, and sorrow for, for a situation that somebody feels. And I think what, we, what you really want is you want leaders that feel a level of empathy, uh, that can understand what's happening and, and share in uh, and share feelings with others, that have a real feel for what is happening down there at the lower level. Um, you know, certainly in, in my experience, uh, you know, when the loss of the loss of a, of a teammate in a subordinate organization, uh, while the leader may not have had a very close relationship, understanding that uh, that uh, that. Uh, uh, you know the people around them did, and so you've got to you've got to recognize that that impact uh, that happened. Uh, I mean, the, on the worst night of my military career, we lost 37 people in one in one operation uh, when a helicopter was shot down. It was absolutely devastating. We literally lost an entire tactical organization in that one fell swoop, and the impact on the organization was far-reaching and deep, and it really required uh, leaders, not just me, but at all levels above and below me, to really focus in on that and understand what had just happened to that organization, not just to feel bad about it, but to, but to share feelings and, and, and understand the impact uh, so that they can begin to move forward. That is really important. One of the things I always try to remind uh, the people that I'm working with is that it's important to understand that, uh, you know, you, you've probably heard this before, everybody is going through something. You're not immune to challenges in your life because of your high military rank or your economic status or your your level of education, people, everybody is dealing with something. And so it's extraordinarily important to, I think, to remember that, that people have got things going on in their own lives. And particularly right now in this time with, uh, you know, with fam with people home who are trying to take care. I don't have, I don't have young children at my home. I know you do, uh, but I'd have employees at, at, at Ben's business executives for national security that do have children. And they're not only are they trying to do their job, but they're trying to, you know, be a school teacher and do a bunch of other things that are, that are, you know, that are, that are uh, put a lot of pressure on. I think you have to, you have to have an understanding of that and, and an appreciation for that and demonstrate a level of kindness uh, and, um, and understanding in, in terms of that. And I think that's imperative for, for effective leaders. You talked about um, this, the, the worst, night of your military career, how do you coach a team out of that? How do you lead the rest of the organization through something like that um, to be able to continue the mission and, and look to the future with something that tragic? Well, you know, in this case, uh, you know, this was, uh, this was a horrendous situation, uh, a helicopter down behind enemy grounds. And we know we've got a lot of casualties, fatalities there. We we literally had to rely on all everybody around us to help us with this uh, and uh, and recognize that we could not do this ourselves. We had to call conventional organizations in to go in and of fight their way in there to, re to secure the site and help us recover our our uh, our fatalities. Uh, we had to rely on others to, to help uh, get them back so we could honor them. And then we had to get them back to their families and to get out and do things. So you had really had to develop this idea of, uh, of, uh, of you know, taking a community uh, approach to kind of addressing these very huge, huge issues. And then I think uh, what we had to do is we had to demonstrate a commitment that, uh, that we were going to recover from this. As I mentioned to you, in this situation, we literally lost an entire SEAL troop of 20, 24, 25 people um, in one fell swoop. And, and so, you know, we had to rebuild that organization and it took us about a year to do it. Uh, but uh, but uh, but the or the organization and the organizations below me did a very effective job in doing it, and then we were actually able to recognize that and 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 support all of that. And so it's about you know it's about you know uh, I think bringing as much support as you can to address the situation, but it's also about the resilience of of seeing your way through and recovering from this, and and giving people hope and a, and a plan for how you get to the other side of all of this. And uh, and in my that was that was absolutely essential in this case. You talk about bringing together a community and an all hands on deck approach to getting something through that. Um, in your new role as president and CEO of Benz, right? You've got um, business executives for national security focused on applying best practices from the business world um, to the most pressing national security issues. What opportunities do you see for public and private to come together in a whole of community um, approach to help us solve not only um, COVID-19 and all that the world is going through right now, but um, looking ahead even at 21st century challenges? Yeah, so I, you know, I, I think you're hitting on it right here. This idea of public, private, civic. 
uh, collaboration, communication, cooperation, I think is absolutely essential to this. And I think what we need to do and what Ben's is going to attempt to do is try to help create a better model for how we how we uh, orchestrate that. Um, I mean, I think you're seeing you're seeing some of this play out as we as this uh, pandemic unfolds, where businesses are rising to the occasion and they're they're stopping this and they're doing this and uh, are doing something that is supporting the effort. And, and I think you see a variety of of different businesses and other organizations doing that. But but what we, what I think we need is a, is a more uh, collaborative approach in terms of doing this. A recognition right from the beginning that we have to have an effective approach for public private and civic uh, cooperation and collaboration in terms of these events. I think that's uh, uh, I think that's the number one thing that we can do uh, to you know to help make sure we're prepared for if there's a resurgence or there's another pandemic or there's a, another national uh, emergency that that you know impacts the country widely. Uh, I think this is absolutely um, absolutely essential, and and business executives for national security has the ability to convene and bring people together to talk about this, and then uh, the credibility to hopefully implement uh, you know recommendations that might, that will come out of this effort. Are there any watchouts that you would uh, make sure to flag to CEOs or business leaders right now, or right? in times of crisis or uncertainty? Are there common mistakes? or um, bad habits, if you will, that leaders can make when when the pressure is on? Um, any watch outs that you would give to business leaders? Yeah, I think you got to be careful about assuming how people are feeling in situations like this. I think it's very easy when you have when you're talking to people virtually and they appear to be uh, everything going well. And so everything must be going well in their lives. Um, and I think you, you make a mistake if you assume that that's the case. One of the things that we have been doing at Ben's is uh, is every couple of weeks is uh, kind of commissioning what I term a little bit of a pulse survey, where we just ask the employees, you know, three or four questions, and uh, that can be answered relatively quickly. But the idea is to get some feedback into the leadership. Uh, level here on how people are doing. And what we've identified is uh, is, a, is a number of things about how people are dealing with the current situation, things we can do better, how we keep them better connected to all this. In the last survey, I asked a couple questions here. What, what are your concerns about going back to work? Um, and if and another question, if if we have to extend this further, what what should we be doing that we're not already doing to make the, to make this uh, you know our, our operations better, more effective, uh, you know, and easier for for the people that have to do them? So I think the idea is is creating feedback loops here of understanding what's going on, so you don't make the assumption that everything is good. I, I think you have to you have to be wary of people that uh, have a lack of belongingness, that begin to get isolated, whose needs are not being met in terms of this. And uh, it's incumbent upon leaders of all organizations to try to understand that about their people. This isn't something that people can just deal with by themselves. It's very unique. Uh, and so assuming that everybody has the same level of resilience to this or is dealing with the same, situa same the situation the same way, I think would be a mistake for leaders to make. So there's a big responsibility for leaders right now, um, you know, amid, amid a pandemic to make sure they're communicating appropriately, make sure they're being empathetic to um, communicate proactively to make sure their operations are ready. Um, so certainly appreciate your thinking on that. Um, for my final question, um, Army Rangers, right? <laughs> Some of the most uh, elite war fighters out there today uh, would love to know what did you learn in Ranger school that stays with you today? Well, you know, Ranger School is, uh, at least for Army guys to go through that and some of their joint services, kind of the penultimate leadership school. And that's really how we think about it. It's about small unit leadership. It's about putting people in a highly pressurized uh, situation where they have to perform uh, and they're being denied, uh, you know, food, sleep. Uh, they're going for an extended period of time. So you're creating, you're trying to put a lot of pressure on people to uh, to exert leadership in those types of situations. So I think what what I learned out of that is, first of all, everybody has vulnerabilities. You learn a lot about yourself and your own weaknesses in that particular situation. You learn the importance of teamwork. That uh, you know, when when you're when you're under pressure and you're tired, you have to rely on on uh, other other people there. Um, uh, you under you 
underscore the importance of cooperation uh, in in terms of this. Uh, so I mean, these are these are invaluable um, lessons right here. And I think the one thing you do learn about this, you learn what happens when leaders get tired and they 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 aren't eating, they're not resting, they're not uh, taking time to replenish themselves. What that does over time, and uh, and so you know, even in situations like this, as difficult as it is, you gotta find a way to get rest. You gotta find a way to recharge yourself because tired leaders make bad decisions, um, and that doesn't just impact them; it impacts their organizations. And so you've gotta you've gotta figure out a way to to sustain yourself through all of this. And that's you know, those are some of the things that I took out of my range of school experience that you know impacted me throughout my career. Well, thank you, sir. Um, you know, you've experienced leadership and have, have been called on to lead in some of the most extreme and challenging circumstances. So uh, really appreciate you sharing your insights today with um, business leaders and organizations who are also being called on to lead in uh, one of the most extraordinary times in, in global history. So thank you for being with me. Uh, thank you for sharing your advice and thank you for your service as well. Great. Great to be with Michelle. Good luck to you and to, uh, to all of your clients. Thanks very much. Thank you.